Good afternoon, Latin American. We are welcome you to Intellectual Property Latin American School LAP. We are happy to be with you today talking about this important and interesting topic. Recently, a patent application was granted to Davos an artificial intelligence system. A debate is taking place about whether a machine can create as human beings or whether this prerogative should be exercised by human beings only. Moreover, there is another discussion that breaks out about what is the best means to protect the inventions and creations made by artificial intelligence systems. Is there a legal protection for this creation? Is best not protect them? Or in another hand, is there a Swiss genetic system? We are here today to talk about granted patent by the South African patent offices and the rulings recently issued in Australia on this subject. One of the most relevant and prominent lawyers in the world is invited to speak about all of this. Elapi Gators, the new voices in intellectual property file among Latin America. We are pleasures to share with you, professionals, IP authorities, and officers all over the world in this masterclass. Before concluding, I would like to remind you the inscriptions are open to our Congress held September 22, 21 and 22, together with Australia University. This day, the moderator will be Ivan Milik, a Sons Spanish English translator graduated from the University of Buenos Aires. He also took the course of master's degree and in intellectual property, property at Australia University. He works at Nottinger and Armando Lorne Fins here in Buenos Aires, science 20 and 12, within the patent department. Bienvenidos a esta su casa, la Escuela Latinoamericana de Propiedad Intelectual. Welcome, Iván. Thank you, Sebastián, for the introduction. We would like to thank everyone for attending this masterclass. Today, Ryan Anaud is going to be talking about the recent developments in connection with Davos cases and his recently published book. Ryan Anaud, MD, JD, MTOMT, PhD, is a professor of law and health sciences at the University of Surrey School of Law, adjunct assistant professor of medicine at the David Geffen School of Medicine at the UCLA, and a mediator and arbiter with Jams Inc. He's the author of the original robot, Artificial Intelligence and the Law, published in 2020 by Cambridge University Press. He has published widely on issues associated with life sciences and intellectual property in leading legal, medical, and scientific books and journals. And his research has been featured prominently in the popular press, including The Times, The New York Times, The Financial Times, and another outlet involving professors. Professor Aud has worked as an expert for, among others, the United Kingdom Parliament, the European Commission, the World Health Organization, and the World Intellectual Property Organization. He's a licensed physician and a patent attorney in the United States, and a solicitor advocate in England and Wales. Managing Intellectual Property Magazine named him as one of the 50 most influential people in intellectual property in 2019. Uh, welcome, Professor Abbott. Thank you for, for being here with us. We're eager to hear you. The floor is all yours. Your microphone's off. Thank you. That's too bad. What I said was brilliant. I don't think I could recapture it, but I'll try to start again from scratch. Um, thank you so much for having me. It is a real honor to be here today with you. Um, I am going to share my screen because point, or at least my students do. And this has been a very exciting recent couple of weeks for artificial intelligence and intellectual property, which is one of the areas I'm most interested in. I'd like to talk about the recent cases, as, as you heard of, involving Davis and the grant of intellectual property for uh, AI-generated inventions. But I'd like also to talk a bit about the larger phenomenon of AI stepping into the shoes of people and doing human sorts of things, a bit about AI and IP more broadly as well, and we'll talk about the cases and some of the recent going-ons and updates. 
I'll plan to speak to about the top of the hour so we can leave some time for, for questions and debate and uh, really look forward to engaging with all of you on this. So AI is doing some really very exciting things these days. You know, among other things, a couple of years ago now, which is practically ancient history in the world of AI, we learned that AI could beat the world's leading champion of the board game, Go. It's been some time since it beat the reigning champion of the board game, Chess, but Go is just about the most complex traditional board game for an AI to play because there are so many possible board configurations, more configurations than there are atoms in the universe. And so it's not a problem that can be solved simply by relying on very powerful computers. They need to develop ways of logically reasoning about things, whether or not those are the ways that people do that. When AI beat the world champion of the board game Go, it was then beat by a new version of the AI, which instead of being trained on human games, just learned to play the game by itself, playing only against itself. And it was able to beat its predecessor essentially every single time. So this gives some indication of the speed at which AI is advancing. And there is now an entire field of human activity that machines can dramatically outcompete people in, namely traditional board games. Now, traditional board games aren't the most practical endeavor, which is why society has not radically been transformed by this. Problem solving principles of this are similar, whether or not you're trying to solve for winning a game of Go, detecting pneumonia in an x-ray or driving a car. And AI's ascendancy in this field gives a hint that AI may do this in some other fields and may do so at speeds that surprise us. Now. AI stepping into the shoes of people is not a new phenomenon. AI has been automating tasks for a long time, for example, in manufacturing facilities. But what is new is how good AI is getting at doing certain things. And always to be borne in mind that as AI gets to the point where it does something, it can do an almost unlimited amount of it at almost no additional cost. And AI will only ever get better, whereas people aren't necessarily getting better that quickly. So AI is now stepping into the shoes of doctors and lawyers and scientists and doing the sorts of things that only those professionals used to do. And as this happens, it turns out that the law may treat these behaviors by AI or by a person very differently. And it also turns out that when the law discriminates between AI and human behavior, this tends to have negative and unintended consequences. And the book argues that the solution to this problem is actually for the law not to discriminate between AI behavior and human behavior. That's not to say it shouldn't discriminate between an AI and a person, because an AI, of course, is very different than a person. It doesn't think the way a person does. It doesn't have legal personality. It, of course, doesn't have any human rights. But Functionally, at least, AI can behave the same way that a person can, and this is generally what the law's focus should be on. I think that's illustrated well with a couple of examples, and I'd like to start by talking about tax law, because the only legal area that is more exciting than patents is tax. ...about artificial intelligence putting people out of work or automating jobs for a very long time, at least since the solution, or if not artificial intelligence, then machines. And though these are widespread social concerns, in the past, they haven't really borne out that way. So in the first industrial revolution, there were a lot of people put out of work by machines, but ultimately the machines resulted in vast gains of productivity and people found new lines of work. To give one example, at the turn of the 19th century, about 40% of the workforce was in agriculture, and today it's closer to 3%. But we don't have 37% unemployment. In fact, we have vastly more productive agriculture, and people have found new types of jobs. It may be that the future repeats itself, and that AI automates a lot of work, but people are able to find new sorts of work, all with vast gains to productivity. Although we have not done that well as a society with taking care of the people who have been technologically unemployed. So that may be something we may want to do better. It may also be possible that what AI is able to do is just going to get broader and broader and broader. And there isn't going to be a similar increase in what it is that people can do. But either way, when people are discussing the social effects of automation, they tend not to discuss tax. 
which is unfortunate because tax policy actually has a lot to do with this. And I'm going to talk about it in a US and a UK context. And I admittedly am not terribly familiar with South African or South American and Central American tax laws. But in the US, at least, and in the UK, the way that a person does work and an AI does acts very differently. Let's say, for example, that I have a cash register at McDonald's that's being operated by a machine. And in the US, this is now a common McDonald's and you place your order with a machine rather than a person. Well, when McDonald's does that, they save taxes because in addition to having to pay a, pay a human cashier her wages, they often have to pay payroll taxes on top of that person, which in the US is 12.4% between a person and an employee paid to the government for the privilege of employing someone. But if you can get a machine to do that same job, you no longer have to pay payroll taxes. So if a machine and a person cost about the same amount and they're about as productive, and granted that isn't always an easy comparison or a one-to-one -one comparison, it ends up the tax policy is driving businesses to automate in ways that aren't socially efficient. They're just doing it to save money on taxes. There are other ways in which people are more, you save money by automating in the United States because there are accelerated tax deductions associated with automated labor and because of the indirect tax burden of automated labor that are discussed in the book, but might be a little too detailed for today. The gist of this, though, is that you have an AI and a person doing exactly the same thing, two different legal regimes with tax come to bear, and it pushes businesses to do one inefficiently. The other thing that's problematic about tax policy and artificial intelligence is that robots don't pay taxes. It sounds kind of ridiculous until you realize that almost all tax revenue in the United States comes from wage income because it largely comes from individual income taxes and payroll taxes and individual income taxes are largely wage based. So if we were to put everyone out of work overnight and replace everyone with machines, almost all of the tax base would immediately disappear. And this is going to be particularly problematic if the solution to automation is that the government needs to pay people to retrain a new job type, spread automation, that the government would pay every individual, regardless of their circumstances, what's called a universal basic income or sometimes called by different names. Companies pay taxes too, but in the United States, it's currently less than 10% of tax revenue. And companies not only have lower statutory tax rates, they have significantly lower effective tax rates because they can make all sorts of deductions that people can't take. So if McDonald's replaces that cashier with a robot, they pay fewer taxes up front. And even if McDonald's does become a little bit more profitable, it ends up not submitting the same amount of tax revenue to the government than it would have done if a person was earning that income. What's the solution to a problem like this? I argue that the tax code should be more neutral to behavior by a person or behavior by a machine. And I refer to this as a principle of AI legal neutrality. How could it do that? Well, robots could pay taxes literally, but that probably wouldn't be a very good system because it would be very difficult to define what a robot was for tax reporting purposes. There would be a lot of gamesmanship and there would be a lot of tax avoidance. A better system is probably to eliminate human centric sorts of taxes like eliminating payroll taxes and the need to pay taxes for employing people. That means the playing field would be more even. So if a person's a more efficient option, they should not be automating. And if a machine's a more efficient option, they would be automating, but they wouldn't do it for tax purposes. And we would have to make up that tax, which we could do, for example, by increasing taxes on capital or increasing corporate taxes, which also has a distributional benefit because companies will be pocketing the vast majority of the benefit of innovation and automation. And it seems only reasonable that they would be helping to shoulder some of the social burden on this. Um, a robot and a robot would not be paying taxes. The business wouldn't even be paying taxes based on robots, but it wouldn't be creating a, a system in which people or machines aren't penalized or businesses aren't penalized based on what's doing the labor. 
Of course, it's not just taking over working at a cash register that machine driving cars. So it is also a common sight now in California, although people are not supposed to be doing this to see Teslas on the road driving themselves. And there are quite a few driverless car initiatives going around in the UK and the US right now. Uh, not exactly clear when they'll be widespread. Elon Musk had promised we'd have them in the 2010s, but uh, they're still working on them. They will be here though. And when they are, people are often very intimidated by the idea of having a self-driving car driving them. I mean, indeed, there has already been at least one fatality caused by a self-driving car. That was a few years ago in Arizona when a self-driving car failed to recognize a pedestrian who was crossing the street at night and caused her death. But of course, there are also 30,000 car fatalities a year in the United States caused by people and around a million a year. And concerns about self-driving cars being unsafe are a little bit misleading because it really shouldn't be a question of whether self-driving cars are perfectly safe. It should be a question of whether self-driving cars are safer than people. And on that front, they almost certainly either are now or will be soon because people are absolutely terrible drivers as a class of thing. 94% uh, of automotive accidents are caused by human error. And not only does it end up costing about a million year, lives a year, it, it results in far fewer injury, far greater injury and very substantial economic damages. Now, once again, we have a legal system that, that treats behavior by a person and behavior by a car very differently. So let's say that you're in London and you call an Uber on your phone, and in the near future, you can get a human driver to drive you or a automated Uber to drive you. If those two cars cause an accident, in fact, they cause an accident in exactly the same sort of way, the human driver will be liable under a lower standard of liability, namely a negligence standard. We ask, well, the accident you caused, was that an accident that a reasonable human driver would have caused? And if so, then you're not liable. And if not, then you are liable. But with the self-driving car, because it is a commercial product, it has a higher standard of liability, namely one based on strict liability. We ask, was there a defect in the product or the marketing materials of it? And if so, did it cause an accident? And regardless of how careful someone was in designing that car, if there was a defect and if there is causation, the machine owner is liable. So for commercial products in the US or UK, the manufacturing chain of a commercial product has liability for it. This again, probably isn't a very good system when you consider that you have two entities doing exactly the same sort of thing, but subject to different liability regimes. And again, if self-driving cars are subject to more liability than human drivers, this will discourage their use because it will be associated with more cost to use it. But that isn't a good system if we actually want to have the safer driver operating, in which case we would want in the future self-driving cars driving more than people, and you wouldn't want them subject to two different liability standards. So I think yet again, the law should be neutral as to behavior by a person or behavior by an AI. And we should simply ask, was the accident caused, by, would the accident have been caused by a reasonable driver? And whether or not the vehicle driving is human driven or AI driven, if it is the sort of accident that a reasonable human driver would have caused, then there won't be liability. And if not, then there would be liability. And again, this isn't treating a machine and a person the same way exactly. The AI would not be liable. Uh, it doesn't have legal personality. It doesn't have assets. It wouldn't be concerned about the prospect of liability, but the AI's manufacturers would have the same level of liability as if they were employing a human driver to drive the car. That's interesting for another reason, and it is that, well, this may make a difference while we're on the cusp of deciding, you know, do we want to use a safer artificial intelligence than a person if it has more liability? But not only are self-driving cars going to be safer than people, they're going to be a whole lot safer than people. They're going to be so safe that they're likely to never or almost never cause accidents, in which case it won't really matter what sort of liability regime we have them under because there will be so few accidents. At that point, what's going to matter a whole lot more is the liability standards that we hold people to. 
Because do we want to hold a human driver to the standard of a reasonable human driver if we all have the option to get in a safe driving car that would never cause an accident? And so I think, again, the appropriate standard is still to have one that is neutral between people and AI, but that when AI comes to be the entity that is driving a certain sort of behavior, it would be setting the standard. So when we ask, what would a reasonable driver have done? We are asking at that point, well, what would a reasonable self-driving car have done? And if a person causes an accident that a self-driving car wouldn't have caused, then they would be negligent by comparison to the prevailing standard. And if they caused an accident that a self-driving car would also have caused, then they wouldn't have been liable. In some sense, someone might think that's a little unfair to human drivers who couldn't possibly compete with artificial intelligence. But this is essentially the standard we have now for drivers who have below average capabilities. So if someone has very poor vision or reaction times or severe anxiety, we still hold them to the standard of an average human driver. To do otherwise would be unfair to the sorts of people being injured by substandard drivers. And that rationale really isn't going to change when we all have the option of driving a self-driving car, but someone chooses to drive. It wouldn't prevent human drivers. Elon Musk has suggested we might want to ban human driving, but there are still benefits to allowing people to do these sorts of things, promoting freedom and autonomy. But it would ensure that when someone causes an accident where they have the option of not causing it, that it internalizes the cost of accidents on them. This is not just about self-driving cars, of course. It is really any area in which a machine causes an injury. And last year, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services approved the first AI that could autonomously diagnose disease. So this particular machine diagnoses certain eye diseases that it outperforms generalists at diagnosing and is comparable to specialist levels of diagnosis. But instead of having a machine generate a report for a human physician to interpret, the machine itself diagnoses the presence of a couple of diseases. This is the only machine I'm aware of that can do that now approved in the United States. Uh, and this is an FDA de novo authorized artificial intelligence software device. Uh, but it won't be the last. AI will be diagnosing an increasing range of these sorts of things. And, and this raises the very same question of, if you have a machine diagnosing and a person diagnosing, do we want to hold them to different standards? We probably don't want an AI that underperforms against a human doctor, right? So this means the AI would be liable if a reasonable doctor would have detected something or, or not the AI, but the AI's manufacturer. And similarly, if this machine can always do a perfect job of diagnosing these diseases, we probably don't want human doctors doing the same thing, but doing a much less good job. So we would also send doctors to the standard of an AI, uh, and this is probably going to result in all of us ceding some sorts of tasks to AI where AI can consistently outperform people. And again, not just in diagnosis, but in everything, you know, Da Vinci wrote just sophisticated tools like very fancy scalpels. But the day is coming when you need to have a cancer removed and that da Vinci robot will be able to do the entire procedure by itself. Not only will it do the entire procedure by itself, but it is going to do it much faster than a human doctor, much more precisely and which much faster recovery times and fewer side effects. You may end up going into a doctor's office and the doctor will tell you, I can do your surgery for you or we can have the robot do the surgery. But if I do the surgery, the outcome is going to be worse and you're going to have more side effects and slower recovery, and I can't guarantee as high an accuracy at removing your cancer. And I, for one, would certainly prefer the robot to be working at that point. So we have AI that's taking over all sorts of tasks. Um, you know That will leave more time, presumably, for people to spend their days being creative and inventive. But for better or worse, AI has been creative and inventive for really a very long time. People have been reporting that AI has been making music for decades and decades. The U.S. Copyright Office rejected applications for that in the 60s and 70s. Um, but even though that sort of thing isn't new, AI is getting much better at doing it. And if you go now to, for example, the OpenAI Jukebox Initiative, which you see here, you can listen to music made 
by AI, although that does open a can of worms about exactly who's doing what and when. But it is being done, for example, here in the style of Katy Perry or Elvis Presley or Frank Sinatra. And while the music doesn't sound great yet, and I wouldn't really sit around listening to it for fun, it's getting a lot better. Whereas early AI music was entirely terrible, it's now getting to be almost mediocre. And it may well be in the next five to 10 years that this music gets not only to be mediocre, but halfway good. And when it gets to be halfway good, it will make an unlimited amount of halfway good music at essentially no cost. Now, maybe it will never quite get to be just as good as Katy Perry, but there's only so many Katy Perrys in the world, and the rest of us are going to be competing with AI, which may make music designed just for us to personally enjoy, perhaps at a moment's notice, or perhaps to accompany whatever task we're doing or video game we're playing. Similarly, AI has been making art since at least the 70s. There have been kind of prominent case studies discussed of that, but AI is getting better at it. Now, you may or may not like this painting, but I can't tell the difference between AI-generated abstract art, AI abstract art made by a, a modern master, or abstract art made by my toddler, which probably just says more about my art tastes than AI capabilities. But in any case, this is the portrait of Edward Bellamy that went on sale at Christie's in 2019 and sold for about half a million dollars. There is now a blossoming market in AI art, and there have been a number of art shows devoted to AI art, um, you know, and the world has gone crazy purchasing NFTs. So, you know, things are a little weird right now. The point is, though, that AI is able to make creative sorts of things. And not just creative sorts of things, but even inventive sorts of things. So the past couple of years have seen some dramatic announcements on AI capabilities and research and development. You know, one of the most prominent was last year, Alphabet's company DeepMind announced they had developed an AI called AlphaFold that dramatically outcompeted teams of people at predicting protein folding structure from two dimensional protein sequences. And this was important because unlike Go, which was very technically impressive, predicting protein folding structures can have a major impact on drug discovery. In fact, predicting a protein folding structure may be the task that leads to the development of a new medicine. And more recently, AlphaFold has started publishing vast sequences of, um, of protein structures online for researchers to be using. If November of last year is too uh, long ago for you, in June this year, a team from Google published a journal, an article in the journal Nature, in which they described an AI system that is able to design microchips far faster, six hours as opposed to months, than a human team, and substantially with improved performance over a human team. It is, in fact, interesting that they publish this for many reasons, one of which is that, that in my research, the earliest example I could find of someone saying that an AI had invented things was at Stanford in the 1980s, and this involved good enough at it that it is going to be commercially viable now or in the new future. And this is going to have really a very dramatic social, economic, and legal impact, among other reasons um, to do with subsistence of intellectual property or whether intellectual property rights will exist in this sort of thing. This is a case study discussed by Siemens at WIPO's first conversation on AI and IP in 2019 by Beat Weibel, who's chief IP counsel at Siemens. And on the left, you have a picture of a conventional car suspension. And on the right, you have a car suspension designed by Siemens. And when Siemens wanted to file for a patent on this new car suspension, they found they were unable to because the engineers involved in making it said that this was an AI generated design and that they had fed some designs into an AI. They told it what they were looking for. The AI spit out a new design that was obviously valuable and none of them were willing to say that they had done anything inventive at all. And this wasn't just them um, standing on principle. In the United States, it is a criminal offense to deliberately and inaccurately list yourself as an inventor. And among other problems for Siemens, they weren't able to file a patent because they didn't have an inventor that they could have listed on the application. 
And so as a result, there was a real open question for them about whether in the absence of a traditional human inventor, you can get a patent on something like this at all. Well, we had a similar sort of case, um, and sorry, before I mention that, and just to be clear on this, this is at the far end of the autonomy spectrum of artificial intelligence, although we are there now and we are going to increasingly be there in, in future years. Most of the time when people use AI in research and development, it's very clear that you have a human inventor. And, and there's a lot of ways you can do this. Sometimes selecting a problem can be solved, to be solved can make you an inventor. Most of the time though, that's not the case. Most of the time, the problems we're solving are well understood. For example, I would like a new cure for COVID-19. If I run Pfizer and I tell my research scientists that and they come back with a cure, I don't get to list myself as the inventor. Sometimes um, programming a machine to solve a problem can make someone an inventor, especially if, for example, I am developing machine to find a cure for COVID-19 or very carefully selecting training data for it. Uh, that doesn't work, though, in cases where you may have hundreds or thousands of people programming an AI that may be built in part on open source code spread over time and space, and especially not if the people programming it don't know what problems it's being used to solve. So it may be that one group of people train an AI with some level of problem solving capability, for example, the ability to design new industrial components given certain input parameters. Uh, but another team is using it, at least in the United States, to be an inventor on a patent, you have to have conceived of the claims of an invention. So if you program a machine and someone else goes and uses it to do something, that wouldn't make you an inventor. Finally, recognizing the value of something can sometimes make you an inventor. For example, if you observe that penicillin is inhibiting bacterial growth for the first time, uh, but that probably doesn't work where an AI, you know, for example, where an AI says, here's 10 possible cures for COVID, go test them and see which one works best. But it probably wouldn't work if you ask an AI to cure COVID and it says, here's an antibody that I know with 99.9% um, you know, probability is going to be effective for this. Here's how you'd formulate it. Here's how you'd test it. And here it is pre-formatted in a patent application. Now we're not quite there yet, but it is true that AI can recognize the value of its own output if you tell it what to look for, who again may not be the person actually looking at the output of an invention. So at least some of the time you have an AI behaving in such a way that you do not have a traditional human inventor. So we had a case that was, um, sorry, I was jumping ahead of myself. These sorts of issues have come to the attention of regulators in recent years. In 2019, for example, the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office put out a request for consultation for comments on AI and patents and another one for AI and intellectual property more generally. They published their report in 2020. Last year, the U.K. Intellectual Property Office did the same and they published their report this year. Those two reports ended up having two very different outcomes. And so you can see there are a variety of opinions in this space. Uh, aside from the UK IPO and USPTO, there have been a number of very high profile reports in this space in recent years. One of these recently from the um, National Security Commission on Artificial Intelligence in the United States. That was dealing with AI as industrial policy and as a national security issue, the finding of which was that America is not prepared uh, for the AI arms race. But even in a report like that, it is interesting that AI and intellectual property was one of the major prongs of national security with AI and of industrial policy with AI. And a lot of it. their fourth session, AI and IP, although they have broadened it a bit to be disruptive technologies, and now this upcoming session is focused on data. Uh, WIPO, though, unlike individual member states, is not looking so much to generate normative conclusions to these issues. 
They're helping stakeholders engage in dialogue and setting out some of the issues. They also did a similar public request for consultations and have published issues papers associated with this. And so this is particularly important because global trade and innovation often are not bound in by jurisdictional boundaries. And so it is important that we have a global the way it's supposed to. So coming back a bit to the IP and or, or case. Sorry, Professor. It uh, raises a number of issues. You know, the first being. Even get, yes. Yes. Uh, we are Can you hear me? Some, some, Yes, I, uh, we can hear you. We're having some trouble to uh, follow you uh, as regards to the sound. Perhaps if you can uh, find a better way to uh, recognize the signal or perhaps uh, take uh, turn off your camera, it will be better to hear us. How does this sound? Oh, much better. Okay. Well, I know you all wanted to look at me, but you know, we all have to deal with disappointment. So we will stick with the good sound. So, sure. you know, the, the Siemens case study raises at least three issues. You know, one is, can you get a patent if you don't have a traditional human inventor? Two is, well, who or what would be listed as the inventor on something like that, if anything? And then three is, who or what would own something like that? that. So much like Siemens, I was involved in a similar case study, although we went ahead and filed for a patent application on this. And, and here is a, a copy of the PCT application, where you see that the inventor for these new inventions is listed as Dabis. The invention was autonomously generated by an artificial intelligence. And the applicant is Dr. Stephen Thaler, who is Dabis's donor. And just to give you some sense of how a machine can make something like this, in early versions of the machine, it had at least two neural networks. The first neural network is trained on data, so it's exposed to a whole lot of data, say pictures of faces. And then it essentially perturbs its own connection weights, which corrupt the data it's been trained on, and it spits out data that's never been seen before. So it makes novel data based on data it's already seen. If you showed it a bunch of faces, you know, then it might be spitting out some amal amalgamation of faces like a combination of Donald Trump and Joe Biden's face together. You then can train a second network to look at the first network and say, well, what's new? How new is it? And if you tell it what you're looking for, like a car suspension that you know, does a better job than a standard car suspension, it can identify value. That was back in the 90s. You know, These days, the machine has hundreds or thousands of more of neural networks and millions, billions, or trillions of individual uh, artificial neurons. And each neural network encodes basically for a concept. So for example, an academic and all of the linguistic synonyms for something like that, like a professor or a lawyer or a lecturer or a mentor. Um, another concept would be boring. Um, and another concept would be escape. And so the machine is mentored at early stages to combine concepts in basic ideas. So one might want to escape a boring academic lecture. In later stages, the machine is allowed to run unsupervised and the machine brings together basic concepts into complex ones and identifies when it has an idea of value. So we allowed Dabas to run um, during an experiment and it came up with two ideas of value in essentially natural language for a claim for a patent. One is a beverage container based on fractal geometry, which could, for example, improve transportation, grip or storage. And the other is a flashing light that activates in a particular manner to preferentially attract human or AI attention. Now, before filing this, there really wasn't a lot of law on the subject. There is law in some jurisdictions that either says explicitly or, or not so explicitly that an inventor has to be a natural person. You know, but anywhere I'm aware of this, this was done to deal with the 
possibility of a company or a sovereign, something with legal personality being an inventor. And of course, a company is very different than an artificial intelligence because a company has to act through its agents, its human agents, and an AI, as you've seen, doesn't have to. So if IBM is the patent owner of something, if they didn't have to list human inventors, then they would never have to list the employees at IBM who make things, and that would deny those people acknowledgement and potentially financial benefits. But of course, an AI doesn't necessarily have a person in that role, so the AI may functionally be the actual divisor of an invention. There is more law, or there was more law, on the subject of AI-generated works and copyright. So the United Kingdom was the first country in 1988 to explicitly provide for protection of computer-generated works. And in circumstances where an AI makes something for which copyright should subsist, in the absence of a traditional human author, the producer of the work is legally deemed or fictionalized to be the author. So that is to say the person who makes arrangements to have the work made, and there is a shortened period of protection, which I believe is 50 years. In the UK, it is otherwise generally 70 years plus the life of an author, which of course wouldn't work with an AI, which never dies and also never lives. You know, But even with a fictional human author for an AI generated work, there is still a shortened period of protection. The US on the other hand has gone the opposite direction formally at least since 1973, but informally since before then. That is not, however, based on a statute or a law. It is based on a policy of the Copyright Office, which is basing that policy on the 1980-something case of Burrough Giles v. Cerrone, which was a Supreme Court case involving this very famous photograph of Oscar Wilde. In that case, Napoleon Cerrone took a picture of Oscar Wilde. The Burrough Giles Photographic Company infringed it, and as a defense argued that you couldn't have copyright in a photograph because it was just a mechanical reproduction of a natural phenomenon. And the Supreme Court held that any tangible way in which an idea in the mind of an author is given expression are eligible for protection. So this included photographs and the Copyright Office has interpreted this to mean that machines don't have minds and therefore cannot have copyright. Um, machines or monkeys. So this policy was almost challenged a few years ago in the monkey selfies case. This involved a crested macaque named Naruto, which took its own picture belonging uh, with a camera belonging to a photographer, David Slater. And there are various versions of how this came to be. In early versions, the monkey just picked up the camera and took its picture. In later versions, he very carefully staged the scene for the monkey to take its picture. Um, this is incidentally not a happy monkey. Macaques smile like this is a display of aggression. So he's looking at his own uh, reflection in the camera and wanting to intimidate that monkey. Uh, whether or not that was successful, this picture certainly had commercial value. And when he went to exploit it and people infringed it, he complained. And the matter seemed to resolve itself when the Copyright Office updated its 1973 policy called it a human authorship requirement and explicitly stated that photographs taken by monkeys can't get copyright protection. But a few years later, PETA, People for the Ethical Treatment of Animals, sued David Slater in district court in California, federal district court in California, alleging that the monkey owned the photograph and that PETA would help bring the lawsuit. And that case was dismissed on uh, at the Court of Appeals but it never actually got into the merits of the underlying policy decision. It was simply dismissed based on standing. Uh, the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals said, unless Congress very plainly states that an animal has standing to bring a lawsuit, we are not going to allow an animal to bring a lawsuit. Therefore, the case is dismissed. So as of yet, there have still been no cases on this policy. Which brings us back to patents, um, where now we have patent applications either issued or pending in 17 jurisdictions around the world and asking these sorts of questions. And the view being submitted is that this is a sort of thing that we want to protect with patent protection because while of course machines are not receptive to patent incentives, the people who make, build and use the machines are receptive to patent incentives. And if we want in the future for Pfizer and Johnson and Johnson and Moderna 
to be working with companies that are developing sophisticated artificial intelligence to help find new cures for new diseases or to repurpose existing drugs for new diseases, then that sort of activity requires patent protection. And if we don't grant patents on that, it essentially says to those companies, you can't use AI in this fashion in your research and development, even if it is far more efficient to use the AI or the AI could do a much better job than a person. Um, the AI is listed as the inventor on the patent for several reasons. First, because there isn't a person who qualifies traditionally as an inventor and because the AI meets inventorship criteria independently and also to keep someone from taking credit for work they haven't done. So in past instances of this, people have reported that, in, that patent attorneys have simply said to machine owners, just list yourself as the inventor and no one will be questioning that, which is true, although that may come back in litigation to render a patent invalid. Uh, but in any case, if I get AlphaFold or Dabis to invent 100,000 things, it wouldn't be reasonable for me to put my own name on that. And it would really devalue the work of other inventors who exhibit legitimate human ingenuity. And finally, it is a means of informing the public that this is an AI generated invention. The AI, of course, would not own the patents. No one has ever suggested this. Again, it wouldn't make sense for a variety of reasons. Not only could an AI not legally own a patent, but um, wouldn't know what to do with it or care about it in the first place. The AI's owner would own the patent. And this is supported on the basis of a variety of common law rules surrounding property ownership. For example, the principle of accession, which holds that title to property can be based on title to some other property. So a farmer owns the fruit from her tree or the calf from her cow. Um, to every cow, it's calf, and to every book, it's copy, as the King of Ireland once said. Or principles of first possession, which we see in other areas of property law, which essentially have that unowned property belongs to the first person to possess it. Sorry, Professor, but. if you are talking, we cannot hear you. Uh-oh. Oh, uh, that's, that's you. Oh, you may... sorry. Um, you? you know, I, I blame the AI. Um, where did you lose me? Uh, at, at the beginning of this uh, screen. Oh, okay, well, not, not too bad. So on the 28th of July, we received our first patent. This was in South Africa with the AI listed as the inventor and the AI's owner as the owner of the patent and any legal rights in the patent. South Africa does not do substantive patent examination, but these patents have already been through substantive patent examination in the UK and before the European Patent Office. In those two jurisdictions, we were able to file the patents without disclosing an inventor and have them go through substantive examination. And then when we corrected the inventorship, it, they were denied on a formalities basis. These patents haven't actually been rejected anywhere. They have been denied in some jurisdictions, essentially for us not filling out forms correctly. And South Africa does do formalities examination. And so this was what got the patent denied in other jurisdictions. Uh, two days later, on Friday, July 30th, a uh, federal court in Australia issued a 41 or 51 page reasoned decision about why it is that it was appropriate for an AI to be listed as an inventor and for the AI's owner to own the patent. And it ordered IP Australia to um, reverse its earlier denial and deemed lapse of our patent and if appropriate to issue the patent. As the patent has survived substantive examination, I would expect that the patent would issue, although they have until essentially the end of the month to appeal this decision, and they might. Um, that decision is linked to on our website, which is artificialinventor.com, um, but essentially it, it finds consistently with the arguments we've elsewhere made. Now, all is not quite as well in the Northern Hemisphere as in the Southern Hemisphere. Uh, the UK, sorry, the US Patent and Trademark Office, the UK Intellectual Property Office, the European Patent Office, and the German Patent Office have all denied these applications, but all of these denials are under appeal. We, in April, had a district court hearing in the Eastern District of Virginia in the United States. 
Uh, the judge there seemed not terribly receptive to our arguments. If it was appealed, it would then go to the Court of Appeal for the Federal Circuit, and mm -hmm. potentially the Supreme Court would be after that. In the UK two weeks ago, we had oral arguments before the UK Court of Appeal. It had previously had its denial uh, upheld by the High Court, which is the court of first instance for a appeal of that nature. The High Court judge, however, said that he would have been receptive to the argument that Dr. Thaler could list himself as an inventor simply by virtue of owning Dabas, and that might solve the problem. We disagreed that that was the solution that we thought was right, and so we have just had the appeal at the UK Court of Appeal, and a decision on that is expected in the new term starting in October. We also have an appeal pending before the European Patent Office, where there the issue is a little bit different because under the European Patent Convention, issues of inventorship are not, again, substantive requirements of patentability, and we're left to member states individually. And so it's our position that this should not be a, a bar to the grant of a patent at the European Patent Office. And then also we are uh, before federal appellate courts in Germany, where Germany has suggested that potentially they don't have the same requirements for inventorship and simply naming a person with the closest nexus to an invention might be adequate. Um, in other jurisdictions, it is still pending. And the rules in these jurisdictions do vary somewhat. For example, two member states of the European Patent Office, Cyprus and Monaco, have reported they don't require inventors to be natural persons. Uh, for various reasons, including timing, we didn't end up in either of those offices, but that is something to mention. Israel, for example, does not require an inventor to be listed in a patent application. Um, so there's a lot ahead on this case. You know, AI inventorship and subsistence of AI generated inventions are, I think, really very interesting and are going to be very financially important subject to the extent they are already. But just to give another example of how AI is going to impact intellectual property law is to think about the inventive step analysis or obviousness. And essentially, if to get a patent, you have to show that your invention would not be obvious to an average researcher. And I picked a picture here of London commuters to be average researchers, just because that's about how unhappy they look on a general basis, although now we don't see this in London anymore. But you know, the question for getting a patent is essentially, well, would an average researcher have found something obvious? And people have raised with our case, well, is your case going to change this if Dabas is now an inventor? And the answer is no, because inventive step analysis does not depend on what an inventor would find obvious, because inventors with inventive skill would find most things obvious. It is based on what an average person or a group of average people would find obvious, which is explicitly not something inventive. On the other hand, as average researchers use AI increasingly, it is going to make them more knowledgeable because they have access to superhuman amounts of prior art and more sophisticated because it will now be normal for average researchers to use AI to do things like pattern recognition in big data sets. So AI is going to, in my opinion, raise the bar for inventive step and at some point in the future is going to radically transform it because right now Davis is one inventor amongst very many. But in 20 years, it might be that instead of Pfizer and Johnson & Johnson and Moderna going to rooms of 400 PhD scientists, they are just all using very sophisticated AI to solve these problems. And if AI is the way that problems are solved in a particular field, then I think that AI has to represent the standard of the skilled person. Either the skilled person would be someone using an inventive machine or it would just be the inventive machine by itself. But the question would then become, you know, what would be obvious to AlphaFold if we were asking in this field? Which of course would be a little bit different than reasoning about what a person would find inventive. Although, you know, that's a complex, sometimes criticized test by itself. And I think the test will have to focus more on reproducibility. So for example, if you were to present a problem to AlphaFold with publicly available information, would it be able to solve this problem in a reasonable amount of time? Just to give some sense of how disruptive that might be, this is a picture of a monoclonal antibody. Monoclonal antibodies are the basis of all the best-selling biological drugs. And they're also, well, not monoclonal, but antibodies are made by our bodies to neutralize pathogens. 
And they are essentially chains of amino acids. And one of the interesting things about this from a AI generated invention perspective is there's a finite number of them possible. Now, trillions or more, which means your body isn't going to run out of them anytime soon, and which means that you know every research scientist could spend his or her life working on this without running out of antibodies. But it's not too hard to imagine that an artificial intelligence could sequence every conceivable antibody and just publish those online. And if it did that, if that was considered in the US an anticipatory disclosure, um, that might prevent anyone from getting a patent on a composition of matter for a monoclonal antibody, which is the foundation of all biological patent portfolios. More than that, AI can now, with antibodies, predict binding to antigens, drug 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 interactions, um, you know, formulation issues. So it's not so hard to imagine that an AI could not only sequence every possible antibody, but also tell you what they could be used for which could potentially be used to treat just about any human disease subject, you know, for which a monoclonal antibody could help, which could be a whole lot of human disease. And, you know, not only would that potentially automate a very wide swath of human research, you know, it might also lead to some consolidation by the companies that will own these AIs like IBM and Google. Although I tend to think that's not so bad because if Google cures cancer, Granted, they'll have a monopoly, but we'll also have the cure for cancer. And we do have some safeguards built into patent law for that sort of behavior, um, though they tend to be underutilized. You know, what also is interesting about this is we're talking about machines as they are today, you know, but machines as they are today are not going to stay as they are today for long. Machines are exponentially improving in their speed, cost, and capabilities. And depending on whether you subscribe to this belief that we will have artificial general intelligence, which is a machine that could do any intellectual task a person could do, including improving itself to become artificial super intelligence, which would be a machine that would dramatically exceed our capabilities. It may be in coming decades that machines are not just sort of occasionally inventors, but do completely automate large swaths of research and development which would really fundamentally change the whole patent paradigm. And among other things, if we ever had artificial superintelligence, uh, the inventive step test would really have to change because everything would be obvious to an artificial superintelligence and you would no longer be able to get a patent on anything. Although that would be fine really, because once we have artificial superintelligence, the cost of innovating would be negligible um, and to the extent that we want other sorts of protection for things, because, for example, with drugs, it's not inventing it so much, it's commercializing it, it's expensive. You know, we have other sorts of mechanisms for that, like market exclusivity. I'll just end on this thought that, you know, when IBM's Deep Blue beat Gary Kasparov, this was, again, shocking to the world, because for decades, playing chess had been used as a measure of machine intelligence and of course, now everyday smartphones could be the world's best chess players. But um, Kasparov, after he recovered from the loss, had a bright idea. He thought, you know, okay, so a machine can always beat a person, but I bet actually a person and a machine could do better than a person or a machine because they're strong on different dimensions. A human grandmaster can think very far ahead, whereas Deep Blue could crunch 300 million moves in a second. And so if you combine human and AI behavior, you can augment one another and really get improved performance. And he was right about that. And he won the world's first human AI centaur chess tournament. Uh, but he was only right about that to a point. You know, the same year that uh, AlphaGo beat the world's best Go champion, um, the chess engine Cryptic beat the world's best human plus AI team. So while the near future is going to rely very heavily on human and AI augmented interactions, in the long term, we may just get in the way of some of this. And I think, again, that's the right terrifying note to stop on. Would welcome all of your comments and suggestions, and I see some are in the, uh, the margins. Thank you, Professor Abbott, uh, for this incredible and amusing class. It was a pity that your camera was off, but as, a, as the most top-notch AI, we have come with this challenging task of following your woes only. Uh, and I can say it is remarkable how fast AI is being developed and taking over certain tasks. 
As to patents, uh, it seems that it is more difficult to name an IA as an inventor in those jurisdictions in which the quality of an inventor is preserved for human only, as to opposed to the jurisdictions in which uh, the quality of an inventor is more uh, broad. Yes, yes, we have some questions here on the chat. Uh, let's start with one of them. The first one, do you consider that AI system must have some type of legal personality to be subject to obligations? Uh, I think that the question relates to liability on AI systems. Sure, and, and let me actually start by kind of addressing the comment you made about jurisdictions in which this sort of thing is protected for people. I'm certainly not aware of any jurisdiction that deliberately prohibited protection for AI generated inventions to allow that sort of thing to only be protected by activity by people. It, it may be that there are some statutes that refer to inventors as natural persons, but I think that that could only be by historical accident unless there was a very recent amendment in light of this. And for all the reasons that I said, I think I would be against a protectionist scheme of that nature because I think it is not what we want out of any law, but especially not what we want out of patent law, which is much more about protect, you know, generating socially valuable innovation than it is about protecting the moral rights of human inventors who will already have their rights protected under existing patent laws. Uh, as to Anna's great question here, do I think that AI needs legal personality to be subject to obligations? Well, I think this. I don't think, so firstly, I think there is nothing doctrinally impermissible about giving an AI legal personality or subjecting it to obligations. But I think as a practical matter, it just doesn't make sense. I, I haven't come across any instance in which it could make sense. You know, and, and maybe the leading example where it might almost make sense would be if you had a self-driving car, you know, it could have some kind of legal personality and an insurance policy so it could pay out for claims. But any way that you think about that, it's not a good system. You, you, they're all going to be commercial products. And it still works much better to have the manufacturer of the car liable for its accidents. So Tesla liable for self-driving Tesla accidents. They will be in the best position to improve the safety of the car and to do that on an ongoing basis. They are the ones benefiting from the sale of the car. So it should be liable for harms it causes. And they can pass on those costs through insurance and ultimately to consumers. So uh, my position is not that AI couldn't have legal personality, but that it just wouldn't be a good idea. You know, for the same reason that obligations associated with AI behavior shouldn't really be on the AI per se, which can't react to them in the sorts of ways that we want a reaction. It would be on the users or operators or developers of the AI, depending on the situation. Thank you. Uh, let's do another one. Uh, rather, rather than holding people or AI to a reasonable person standard, wouldn't it be better to apply something more case specific like the hand rule or formula uh, USB Carol towing to determine negligence? Well, the hand formula is also part of a negligence test. Um, something more case specific. I mean, so that is essentially, you know, a judge's heuristic of asking whether or not something would have been reasonable essentially from a socioeconomic analysis, which, you know, has some problems with it, you know, on its own merits, but essentially would be part of this test. So, um, you know, I'm having trouble thinking of an AI in the, in the Carol towing case, but, um, you know, if we were essentially asking whether it was reasonable to get kind of the newest, fastest version of an AI self-driving car that was a little bit safer, you know, that's the sort of situation I think where the hand formula would come in. Of course, with, with driving now, we don't demand that everyone has the world's safest car, even though it would save a lot of lives because the world doesn't have an unlimited amount of money. On the other hand, we do in the U.S. require that everyone have working brakes. 
So there does have to be some, you know, rule of reason about at what point one can be expected to automate. And here it would be essentially that, you know, it, it was available and reasonably practicable from a cost perspective, you know, because again, we can't expect everyone to go buy a Tesla X tomorrow, but that sort of thing will, I think, be practicable in the medium term. Thank you, thank you. Um, let's do the next one. Do you consider it worthwhile to grant copyright to an AI? Uh, well, with the prolification of the AI being expected in the coming years, don't you think it, it is more important to protect AI itself than the fruits of its generation? Well, it depends. Um, so I'm not against protection on AI, which can be trade secret, copyright, database, or patent protection. But there is a big difference between protecting the AI itself and protecting the AI's output. So, for example, Davis could be, well, Davis is patent protected and could be the world's most valuable AI, but it is less about you know, but, but the use case we're looking at is whether or not to use AI to generate socially valuable output. Let's take the example of the beverage container that Davis has made, right? So a lot of investment goes into make, having Davis make something like that. But if the output was not protected, then the minute that beverage container was sold, it could be reverse engineered. You know, similarly, if AlphaFold comes up with the cure for COVID, You know, again, while AlphaFold may be protected by copyright, patents, trade secrets, whatever, um, you know, if the cure for COVID isn't protected, although COVID is controversial, and I don't mean to wade too much into that here, but, you know, the cure for rheumatoid arthritis, you know, to get a drug company to invest in bringing that to market, the output itself is going to need protection. That's not always the case. You know, some inventions are well protected by trade secrets or You know, in the software industry, for example, there's much less need for protection. It's largely about first mover advantages. So, you know, it is not always that one needs a patent, but to the extent that patents are agnostic as to field, uh, it, it's a similar sort of arrangement as would be with human output. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Uh, one more, can AI determine the application of ethical criteria, malicious actions, or prevent crimes against people, or do they simply comply with the guidelines? Well, that's an interesting question is phrased. I think the answer is both, right? Of course, an AI does what it has been told and trained to do. Sometimes what AI does is very predictable if you have an expert system, for example, and sometimes it is not so predictable when you have, for example, you know, deep learning systems. Um, but if you wanted to make an AI to follow ethical criteria, one could certainly do that within having it follow guidelines. And there is, you know, very much so AI governance structures designed to get AI to both behave in ethical ways and to have people use AI in ethical sort of ways. And for example, the European Commission has recently released a draft AI regulation, which um, you know, is like GDPR, but for AI in the European Union. And that would, for example, prohibit certain uses of AI for widespread facial recognition or citizenship scoring and require significant regulatory upfront and post-market activity around certain high-risk uses. You know, whether or not that is a good set of regulations, you know, it is certainly the case that regulations like that and governance structures can get AI to behave in ethical sorts of ways. Thank you, that's very interesting. Uh, coming back to IP law, uh, you know, could, could the patent law or any IP law be amending surely, or an amendment will imply an amendment to other related laws. Uh, I believe it will demand a coordinated and comprehensive amendment to all codes and law in forms in order to in, in, introduce AI to, to everything legal. Ah, um, you must have come up with that question from somewhere else. I don't see it in the margins, but... A, a few thoughts on this, you know, excuse me. 
whether or not AI can, you know, be an inventor on a patent or whether or not you can get protection for an AI generated invention really doesn't have anything to do with some of these other issues like liability for self-driving cars or even the inventive step analysis or sufficiency or disclosure or copyright or anything. You know, there are really a whole bunch of issues in which AI challenges our existing ways of doing things. Now, is that sort of thing best addressed by judges interpreting the law as it is today or by policymakers thinking through the social costs and benefits of new laws? I think the answer is both, as it has essentially always been both, that one, you know, there is a law as we have it today on patent law in every jurisdiction. And in some places, I think it's simply not clear whether or not the law could accommodate this sort of thing. Our position is that it should be able to accommodate it, especially because patent laws were designed to accommodate advances in technology. Now, that isn't to say that policymakers shouldn't also be thinking through some of these issues in a global sort of way and thinking about how now that AI is doing these sorts of things, we have kind of new, bigger challenges like what do we do if AI puts 30% of the population out of work? Or, you know, we have much wider disparities in income between Jeff Bezos and me, um, or Jeff Bezos and anyone, I suppose, Um, you know, or we have AI that is generating so much patentable stuff or so much copyrightable stuff, it has really fundamentally changed the paradigm. So, you know, having judges resolve cases isn't a substitute for policymakers also looking at the bigger picture and potentially changing laws where it makes sense. Yeah, that's right. I agree with you that it should be a coordinated uh, action between uh, the the judges and the policymakers, uh, which are in charge of uh, give, giving a framework to the common common lives of every day. Uh, let's do two more. If you agree with, do you consider that? legal regulations to protect data and people's privacy can stop the development of technology? Um, Well, that's a little off topic, but I suppose I'm happy to answer it. Um, These are, you know, the first one is a complicated question. You know, data can certainly be protected as confidential commercial information, right? So one cannot disclose it. There are certain sorts of protections on data in some forms. You know, for example, the European Union has database protections. Um, You know, data is largely not considered by itself as having intellectual property rights per se. You know, that is a topic which is also controversial and has been for a long time and is part of this upcoming WIPO conversation. Uh, it isn't my area so much, and I could see how there could be both benefits and costs to providing greater protection of data. So I guess I'll just kind of mumble on that for a bit and not really answer it. In response to the second question, um, do privacy rights interfere with data? Well, yes, but you know, essentially any principle you have at some point comes into conflict with other principles. So for example, if we, you know, we would probably get a lot more innovation if we had absolutely no privacy rights and everyone could share data as much as they wanted. On the other hand, innovation isn't the only thing that we care about. We also don't want, for example, our sensitive medical information floating around the world. So we accept that there are some limitations to how companies can use our data to innovate because we don't want our privacy rights violated. And so there are often trade-offs and sometimes win-wins where you do manage to find a way to accomplish both goals. You know, that is also something we see in AI regulation where on the one hand, we want transparent, you know, explainability. And on the other hand, we want improved performance. Well, it may be that you could make an AI system that could diagnose skin cancer visually that followed a series of expert rules from dermatologists and which had, you know, 90% accuracy, but you could interrogate it and find out exactly why it did that. Or you could have one that uses artificial neural networks where you literally have no idea what the thing is doing, but it is 99% accurate. You know, so there isn't always a right answer to which one of these principles is best. One does sort of have to, to give the lawyer's answer, 
You know, it depends and you have to look at the facts of a specific case. You know, it, it's interesting in that context, you know, with, for example, diagnosing disease, I think that's an area where accuracy counts a lot more than transparency because there's an objectively right out answer. I have skin cancer or I don't, you know, with some other things like, for example, whether someone should be allowed to post bail or how long someone should go to prison for, you know, that's something where there isn't an objectively right answer necessarily. And so we care a lot more about why a machine has made a particular recommendation. And there is a much greater need for transparency and explainability than there are in some of these other instances. Thank you, Professor. And the last question, um, we would like to have a, a, a uh, sum up a conclusion uh, in connection with this one. Uh, how would it be better to protect AI itself, in your opinion? How can we better protect AI by itself? Yes. Sure. Um, well, I think this is, again, a long-standing issue, you know, with AI essentially being just software. And at least since the 80s, there has been a vigorous debate about how we can best protect AI, which again, you know, I'm, I'm not sure if you're asking on a policy level or at kind of individual business level. There are a lot of different ways to protect software, either as a trade secret or with copyright or with patent law protection. Although you can't patent software per se, you can patent computer implemented inventions and the extent to which you can do that depends on the jurisdiction. You know, but in every case, it really is kind of dependent on the AI, the use case, the industry you're in, you know, and, and which makes sense and under what circumstances. I mean, I will say that the AI industry is probably one where patent protection is a little less important than it is, say, in the life sciences. So, you know, there are also concerns about too much intellectual property protecting software and impeding future innovation. Thank you very much, Professor. I think that the, this class has uh, brought everyone closer to AI and every, every topic related with it. Uh, we have been listening to to you very closely and we will fin conclude in this uh, talk class uh, with Silvina. So the floor is yours if when, whenever you want to. Well, we come to the end of, of our appointment today. Has been a great pleasure and a privilege to have the participation of Ryan today, to whom we thank again for his time and for sharing us with his vast knowledge in Smather. Thank you, Professor. Today we have dealt an issue that surely, very soon, is going to change paradigms. As Ryan mentioned and clearly showed us in his presentation, artificial intelligence already lives with us and its presence will continue growing up. It's our responsibility to go, up, to go with these changes, learn from them and solve those new scenarios that this reality presents us with. At Elapi, we are very proud to organize these events for all of you. And we really want to thank you for showing us today once again. And as a journal secretary, I especially want to thank the team that worked so hard to make this possible, Ivan, marketing team, to our CEO and our CEOs. We want to invite you to follow us on our social networks to obtain information about upcoming events and the latest news on intellectual property. And once again, thank you. Thank you very much. And as we always say, bienvenidos a su casa la Escuela Latinoamericana de Propiedad Intelectual. Muchas gracias. Thank you very much. Bye, Ryan. Thank you.